Local humanitarian aid Gift of the Givers said the emergency teams were on standby to respond to Morocco following a deadly earthquake that had claimed over 2,000 lives so far. 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit the country late on Friday night. At night. Let's get an update. We're joined by teams by Dr. Mtia Suleiman, founder of the Gift of the Givers. A very good afternoon to you, Dr. Mtia. Thank you for your time with us here on the SABC. Good afternoon, Lisa. Thank you very much. Dr. Imchas, in a statement, you said that the search and rescue and medical teams on standby to respond following the deadly earthquake. What's the latest emerging in terms of the, um, of the operations unfolding? Well, the, the problem is that we're still waiting for the Moroccan government to make a request for international assistance. They, have, they are doing it on a country-by-country -country basis right now. We know that Spain has been asked to send in search and rescue personnel, but in the first 56 people are going across from Spain to Morocco. Other countries have offered, but they haven't got confirmation, you know, a definite yes for them to go through. We, in the meantime, are preparing. We have, because we have 25 personnel ready in search and rescue, and five dogs, all ready to move in, because medical teams are on standby. Right now, as I'm talking to you, we're busy with airlines, but four or five different airlines looking at the connection to see what's possible. We're also busy with the South African Embassy in Morocco that speaking to the Moroccan government of our system. Then we have other people we've dealt with over the years through the hostage negotiators. You know, we have connections in the Moroccan government. They've been approached to speak to the government directly. The Moroccan organizations on the ground wanting to work with us. So the, the network is starting to spread and we have people really wanting to go in. We're ready. You know, if, if the commission comes tomorrow morning, somebody said, said, uh, mentioned that there may be a Zoom discussion with the Moroccan government. So there are different op options which you're looking at. But we, when you look at the pictures, they do need the help, no matter what is being said. There's just not enough people to cover the ground. The areas are too widespread. There's too many areas that have been affected. And the personnel won't be enough to get to all those areas quick enough. So without, without doubt, they are going to need search and rescue personnel. They are going to need uh, canines. They're going to need additional medical teams. Of course, the medical the health system is fully functional in the cities. That's not been affected. But all the mountains itself, they will need medical personnel on ground. But it depends on, on you know, what the Moroccan government decides. Right now, I think Spain is the only country that has been allowed to send teams across. Mm. All right, thank you for that update. Um, we were actually speaking to our correspondent earlier on, and there were fears about aftershocks and tremors. What's the reality with regards to earthquakes on that front. There's also uh, talks about Moroccans staying outdoors for fear of that. Uh, what is the best way to, to approach that, um, given the, the uncertainty on that front? That's, that's no doubt. Aftershocks are a normal occurrence in any earthquake. And sometimes aftershocks are like an earthquake itself. They can be very high magnitude uh, aftershocks. There's no way you can stay in buildings, especially those buildings that are built the old traditional way, they're not solid. You know, all the old buildings collapsed in Marrakesh, the new strong ones were standing. So in that area, guaranteed, if aftershocks come, and they will come, and they, they could be sometimes even as big as the earthquake. If that happens, more buildings are going to fall. There is no way you can stay anywhere in your building or near the building. You have to move out, 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 of, out of the building. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is, because it's a mountain, it's high, the, the, there's rock falls, the, the, the roads are not possible, you can't get to the people, communications are down, you can't get help personnel across, you can't get tents, blankets, water, food across to the people, you can't move. So all the, how, how do you get the forklifts, how do you get the rubber removal, uh, the, the, all the type of excavators to on site? And I think that's one of the reasons why the Moroccan government hasn't asked for international assistance, because what's the point of bringing teams in if they can't access the area? Of course, if teams come with earth moving equipment, but no request has been made for that. Then it's a different story altogether. But no way can you stay in those buildings. You have to stay on the outside, you will die. You know, because it's quite often, people are in buildings that more deaths come are because of aftershocks and people are trapped in the same building that they go into after the major earthquake. Mm, no, absolutely. And given the, your expertise in disaster um, response um, initiatives, I wonder what the biggest challenge um, will be for rescue workers and volunteers when they are allowed to to operate how do they also you know look after themselves given the uncertainty of, of what's transpired my rule is very clear your precaution your safety comes first no matter what that's my standard rule but in this kind of business there are risks 
you know, it's, it, there's, there's no doubt about it. You're going to a building, your engineers are inside, and suddenly the building collapses. You know, that can happen. That's a risk. You know that before you leave the country. It, that this, These are chances that that can happen to you. So those are the two biggest risks. You can get caught with uh, falling rocks coming up on the road as you're driving past, and your car can get damaged or you can get smashed. That, that's a possibility. We know all those things, but that doesn't prevent us from, in, from intervening. But we take all the precautions as best we can. And the, the biggest challenge will be to actually get to the site of the earthquake. It's very similar to what happened in the mountains in Nepal. You couldn't get to the people. It was just too complicated to get to the people. It took a long time. In Turkey, there were no mountains. The city was flat. But the, the airport was gone, the roads were gone, everything was gone. It took a long time. It took virtually eight or nine hours just to cover 180 kilometers from Adana to, to Hatay. So you have that challenge. And in this case, it's purely mountain. That is, that was a flat city, you know, and this is purely mountain. The time to get there is going to take much longer. And the longer it takes, the, the, the chances of survival decrease. But fortunately, these buildings are not those high-rise buildings that you had in Hatay in Turkey. Those were 11 floors, 12 floors, or thousands of people were in a building. These are the maximum two-story buildings. But because, you know, it still has concrete, it has fallen on people, it's killed 2,000 people, and it's widespread in various parts of the mountain. So you've got to go to the mountain, and how soon you're going to get there is going to be the big challenge. No, absolutely, Dr. Mtiaz. And not to mention the animals that have obviously also been affected. The historical sites, everyone having to rebuild their lives. What, what comes to the fore, given the historical significance of Marrakesh in Morocco itself? There's, there's many earthquakes where historical sites have been destroyed. Unfortunately, your focus is not on that. Your focus yeah. is on life-saving. You know, right now, the team's going have to take, first of all, save people from the rubble. Secondly, take injured people and get into hospitals so we don't have a death toll from injured people. Thirdly, to have closure, you need to take the bodies out. And then those that survive, of course, they need shelter because they can't stay in the house again. They need water, they need food. Some have minimal medical care, minor medical aid care, they will need that. Then there are people with chronic conditions, heart conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, they will require medication. Everything is destroyed in the building. That will require. And thereafter, of course, comes a big job of rebuilding what has been damaged. And from the feedback, of course, people are saying their houses were rudimentary, they were old in style. You know, we have to look at a new city with all new buildings, with new development, especially if you're a country that's prone to earthquakes. The last, they had an earthquake in 2004. Fortunately, not that many passed on. But in 1960, they had probably one of the biggest earthquakes in their history where 12,000 people passed on. So given the fact that this is an earthquake zone in some areas, they will have to look at earthquake-resistant homes. There's no way you can stop an earthquake from destroying the home, but earthquake-resistant homes that will stand longer, you know, in, in the event of earthquake happening. People want to rebuild their lives. Again, fortunately, this is in the mountains, so the rest of the cities in the country are functional. The economy is fine in those areas. Hospitals are functional. Schools are functional. They'll probably have to relocate kids to go to other schools, move the injured to functioning hospitals, find different opportunities for them. I thought there's a way to rebuild either in the mountain or somewhere else. Mm. Dr. MTS, thank you for that update. Founder of Gift of the Givers, Dr. MTS Suleiman, giving us the latest there.